In this video, I'll review the first three lectures for this class, which were Lecture 1, Music Technology, Lecture 2, The Nature of Sound, and Lecture 3, The Listening Ear. And I'll do this by going through the quizzes that follow each lecture and are required for you to complete. So here is lecture content quiz one. Okay, so this first lecture was devoted to what the heck is this whole area of study of music technology? And it asks this question here about one of the specific music technology activities. What music technology activity entails balancing individual audio tracks for playback as a unified whole? Is that sequencing, mixing, mastering, or multi-track recording? Which, which one of those is balancing individual tracks for playback? If you are balancing individual audio tracks, you are in fact mixing, which is one of the focuses of this class. AI has the potential to, that's artificial intelligence, inspire a renewed interest in classical music, instigate unprecedented changes to the musical landscape, interfere with development in modern music theory, or instill a musical intuition into the minds of animals. AI or artificial intelligence seems poised to really change the musical landscape. There are already computers that are writing uh, songs and instrumental music. So who knows where this goes, especially if we end up with some sort of brain interface. Much of that first lecture was devoted to a discussion of the device called a transducer. So what is a transducer? Is it a technology used to enable sequencing? Is it a device that converts voltage to amperage? Is it a critical component to multi-track recording? Or is it a device that converts one form of energy into another? A device that converts one form of energy into another. So a microphone, like what I'm doing now, speaking into a microphone. It's converting sound wave energy into electricity. So it has converted that from one form to another. Another common transducer is a loudspeaker or just a speaker. Your headphones say that's converting electric energy back into sound wave energy. Question four. This device was the first purely electronic musical instrument. And of course, I'm referring to the peculiar electronic instrument known as the theremin. And it is operated by waving your hands at uh, two antennae, one that alters pitch and one that alters volume. Sort of sounds like a spaceship. That's what I hear every time I hear a theremin. In any case, the theremin was the world's first purely electronic musical instrument. Question five, this device features an electronic motor that drives a series of rotating discs and is used to generate musical notes. That is a tone wheel. Right. A tone wheel is another type of transducer. So it's back to this device here, a transducer. Turns out that there are several varieties in addition to microphones and loudspeakers. There's also tone wheels, which you'll find inside of a Hammond organ. It's a um, rotating disc positioned very near a transducing element, a magnet. This is a tone wheel. If you open up a Hammond organ, you'll find many tone wheels. I'm not positive, but I think there's a tone wheel for each key. This technology is a computer language protocol used to send musical information from one device to another. Well, in class, the first week we were there, I handed out MIDI controllers. Those are small keyboards meant to activate virtual instruments or other computer-based musical instruments, and it's just a language protocol, which means it's code, M-I-D-I. -I. It stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And that 
usually entails a keyboard like this here. This would be a MIDI controller. So there's no sound that comes out of a MIDI controller, just information. Information like what note should I play? How long should I play it? Should I modulate it? Is it a guitar that plays it? Is it some other instrument? That's MIDI. We were sequencing a beat in class this last week. And what you were doing was placing MIDI data along a timeline to play back as a sequence of sound events, activating samples. So you were MIDI sequencing. This combinatoric sound technique creates different timbres by adding various sine waves together. OK, that's a bunch of fancy speak for what's happening inside of a Hammond organ. As I previously mentioned, there are many tone wheels in here, these devices. All right, so you set one tone wheel spinning and say it's it's generating a note. Of course, we can take many notes and stack them together and you get a really far out sounds or you get what eventually begins to sound like an organ. That is a process called additive synthesis, and it is the by derivation, the root of the word synthesizer. So synthesizer like this device here on the right, that's what it's doing. It's combining various sine waves together so as to create new and different and unique sounds. Synthesizer, where does that word synthesizer come from? It comes from this business here, additive synthesis. And what the heck is that? That's a sound technique that creates different timbres by adding various sine waves together. OK, what is music technology? Music technology is. Is it a digital audio workstation? Is it electronic musical instruments? Is it any device activity or, or concept that aids the production of music? Or is it any recording sample or sequence that outlines a musical idea? Well, that all sounds very fancy, but of course. Music technology is any device, activity, or concept that aids or supports the production of music. OK, back to this business of transducers. This first lecture really hit on this device because it's so common in the music technology world. Which of the below is a list of transducers? Is it A, coil pickup, piezo pickup, tone wheel, or microphone? Is it B, dynamic, condenser, electret? Ribbon, is it frequency, amplitude, wavelength, phase, or is it compressor, expander, limiter, and gate? Which one of those is transducers? And of course, the answer is this business here pickups, tone wheels, and microphones. Those are all transducers. Transducer is a device that converts one form of energy into another. Microphones, speakers, pickups, and tone wheels. All right, these are sort of the baser nature of music technology. We've got to get musical sounds into our DAWs. All right, so most instruments on Earth aren't one of these, aren't MIDI controllers just exchanging ones and zeros of data. Most musical instruments on this mortal coil are physical devices that still need to be played. So we need to convert those sounds into electricity. Of course, the principal way to do that is with a microphone, but there are several other ways. Tone wheels, pickups, they turn sound wave energy into electric energy. Okay, which music technology activity consists of placing audio or MIDI samples along a timeline? Okay, this is what you guys were doing this week in class. You were placing samples along a timeline so that it plays back as one coherent whole, and that is sequencing. OK, all right, let's see what lecture content quiz two is all about. True or false, sound is the sensation of vibrations. Uh, well, you know, sort of knocking on the door of being correct, but uh, I'm going to go with false there. Sound as it happens, 
is my definition the compression and rarefaction of air molecules that are set into motion by a vibrating source All right so you have a vibrating source so you have my voice or this tuning fork it starts this peculiar phenomenon where it squeezes air molecules together and then as a consequence the air molecules pull apart and you get this compression and rarefaction wave traveling in one direction right so here it is in schematic form air molecules squeeze together then they pull apart and this is happening as a result of some vibrating source right you can see this violin string and much like water waves being initiated by a pebble in a glass-like sheet of calm water that are emanating out from an epicenter, the sound waves do the same thing in three dimensions from a vibrating source. That's what sound is. And then, of course, hearing doesn't occur until this phenomenon encounters a sentient being with ears and a brain. We usually call it a sound wave. And uh, as it happens, we can measure this phenomenon of the sound wave with five separate measurable attributes. This is when we get our rulers and our stopwatches out, and it comes time to measure and quantify this phenomenon of the sound wave. So yes, indeed, the five fundamental attributes of sound are wavelength, frequency, amplitude, phase, and velocity. Okay, then we investigated Frequency sound above 20,000 hertz is called infrasonic. Infrasonic, which is below 20 hertz. I think I said that wrong. Sorry about that. So if you have sound that's below 20 hertz, it's infrasonic. And if you have sound above 20,000 hertz, it's called ultrasonic. So you might be wondering, well, what's the significance of 20 hertz and 20,000? The reason why I have an animal here that's not a person is because people hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. And that means when it comes time to use our equalizers, you will notice these numbers because these are the sounds that we can hear, right? Here's 20, and then you go all the way up to 20,000. And notice that this equalizer here has a small dip around 1,000. That means the frequencies around 1,000 have been attenuated or turned down. Sound above 20,000 hertz is called infrasonic. True or false, above 20,000 is actually ultrasound. So that's false. The range of human hearing is 100 hertz to 30,000 hertz. You know that the range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20,000. The phenomenon in which one sound covers up and renders inaudible another sound is called masking. That's true. That's one of the uh, unhappy truths about sound is if you have two sounds of similar frequency existing around the same volume, say you have a bass guitar and a bass drum, the louder of the two will often render inaudible and cover up the quieter sound. And this can be a bit of a problem for mixing, obviously. But uh, you don't need to be mixing to experience masking. You're driving around in your car and you have your stereo set just right, but then it gets hot in your car and you put the window down, then all of a sudden you got to turn up your stereo because the sound of the wind coming in through your window is masking or covering up and rendering inaudible the sound of your stereo. Let's keep going. Phasing occurs with the interaction of two or more sound waves. That's true. So Good way to imagine phase is if you have a perfectly calm glass sheet of water and then you perturb it with one pebble and you get water wave phenomenon and then you perturb that glass like sheet of water again with another rock or pebble now you have two sets of interacting waves that's phase phase is the interaction of two or more sound waves Right, you have a sound that is sort of offset with its neighbor, and that results almost 100% of the time in distortion. All right. So phase is the interaction of two or more sound waves. That's true. An octave is an interval that exists in a ratio of three to two. 
let's define our terms here. So an interval is this in the musical context is the distance between notes. If you, if you play a note and then play some other note, you've played an interval. And musicians know uh, many common intervals. Perhaps the most common interval is the octave. And the octave is used to divide up the sound frequency spectrum as follows. So if we go back to our equalizer. So the difference between 100 hertz and 200 hertz is the difference of an octave because 200 is twice as high as 100. And uh, this is those notes approximately. You've got something like 100. And then if you play another note that is a frequency of 200, you have an octave. Anyways, this is a really useful interval for organizing our approach to equalization and for music composition. So that's false. It's not three to two. It's actually two to one. The five subdivisions of the sound frequency spectrum are one low bass, two upper bass, three mid range, four upper mid range, and five treble. So music technologists have divided these, devised these regions of the sound frequency spectrum. And you might even have some version of this on your car stereo. You might have a bass, middle, and treble. Or maybe you've seen equalizers on your devices. Well, this is pretty common, but in music technology, there's a few more subdivisions. We can think of low bass, which is 20 hertz to 80 hertz, real low notes. And then the upper bass, which is a, a couple more octaves, 80 to 320. So 80 to 160 is an octave, and then 160 to 320 is another octave. So upper bass is another two octaves. Similar, the low bass, which was 20 to 80. That was two octaves, All right? Octaves. Moving right up through the sound frequency spectrum, we have the mid range, which is a somewhat large swath of three octaves, 320 hertz to 2560. And then we have the um, upper mid range, just one octave, 2560 to 5120. And then approximately two more octaves because not everyone has perfect 20,000 hertz as their upper range. In fact, if you've li lived for a few decades, eventually that starts going down. I'm one of them. And that's called treble or the really high notes. Question nine, timbre describes the sound's unique character or quality. Right, so now it's just vocabulary. Uh, timbre is uh, a sound specific character or quality. My voice sounds different than your voice. You know that it's your mom on the phone and not your girlfriend because of the timbre. They could be saying the exact same set of words, but their voices sound different. To what degree they sound different describes the degree of difference in timbre. Different instruments have different timbres. Bass, guitar, and tuba can play the same notes, but you can tell the difference between the two due to their timbre, even while they're playing the same musical passages. And finally, question 10, amplitude describes the volume of a sound. That's right. So amplitude in the context of our measurable attributes of sound describes the height of the wave, or more accurately, it describes how many air molecules have actually been perturbed by the vibrating source. And we think of amplitude with our model, the sound wave, in terms of height. So if we look at these two sound waves, this one that says high amplitude and this one that says low amplitude, what's different about them isn't their frequency, right? They both appear to have a frequency of four if this is one second, right? If this is just one second of time and this is our sound wave, they're just four hertz a piece. So they're making the same pitch, but this wave is taller than this wave which means physically this sound wave has perturbed or bothered 
or squeeze together and pull it apart more air molecules, right? You think of a pin drop, like, okay, it's sort of manipulating its neighboring air molecules. But then think of something really loud, like a speaker system or a drum set, like it's really crushing the air molecules into their compression wave. Okay, and finally, let's check out lecture content quiz three, which is all about how to listen intelligently. Let's preview this action, start a new attempt. And this is the main point, right? What, what is the most important resource an audio engineer can have? A, a digital audio workstation, B, healthy ears, C, access to good gear, or D, dynamic and condenser microphones. Now, eventually you should have all of those other things, but healthy ears is the foundational resource. You can't hear or make sense if you don't have healthy ears. Uh, what is the outer part of the ear called? Which is to say, what is the part that you can see? All right, so here's a schematic of the ear. So what is this part here, right? The part you can see. Is that called the tympanic membrane, the ossicles, the cochlea, or the pinna? Now, I'm okay with just calling it the earlobe because this is not anatomy and physiology class, but the fancy name for it is the pinna. That's the outer part that you can see. Okay, going further inside, what is the name given to the three tiny bones of the middle ear? Is that A, tympanic membrane, B, ossicles, C, cochlea, or D, pinna? So the fancy name for the three tiny bones inhabiting the middle ear, the malus, incus, and stapes, collectively known as the ossicles. Or in music technology class, just the three tiny bones inside your skull, right? The three tiny bones in your ear. That's part of the middle ear. So the outer ear, the part you can see is the pinna, right? Then the ear canal. And then this thin sheath of skin is the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, which is affixed to the three tiny bones, which amplify the vibrational energy. And that's the middle ear, outer, middle, and then the inner ear. Let's see if there's any more questions that address the physiology of the ear. Here we go. What is the name given to the sense organ inhabiting the inner ear, right? The heck is this thing, right? What is this goofy snail? Let's take a look. Is it the tympanic membrane, the ossicles, cochlea, or the pinna? The answer, of course, is that goofy looking snail organ is called the cochlea, right? This is the part that you do damage to anytime you expose yourself to loud sound pressure levels, right? You're at a loud concert, you have a, a loud system in your car, or you spend a lot of time with loud headphones on. And do know that you are doing irrevocable damage to your cochlea. Okay, so let's learn more about the cochlea. Inside the cochlea are many hair cells adorned with further hair-like projections. Inside the cochlea are many hair cells, which are sort of like nose hairs. and Protruding from these nose hair like projections are further hairs. And what are those called? Cochlea, stapes, incus, stereocilia. And the answer is stereocilia. So, remarkably, attached to all the thousands of hairs inhabiting the inside of your cochlea, this is the inside of a cochlea, right? And you, you have all these little trees here. These are like nose hairs. Right. And attached to each one of those nose hairs is this remarkable nerve ending called a stereocilia, right? And it's perturbed by the sound energy, right? Here's the eardrum. Here's the three tiny bones. Here's the cochlea. The last of the three tiny bones is shoving back and forth on the cochlea, and it's stimulating these nerve endings, right? At which point, 
the physical phenomenon of sound becomes hearing. Tree falls in the woods, it compresses and rarefacts air molecules, but hearing doesn't occur unless a sentient being possessing ears and a cochlea and stereo cilia and a brain converts it into hearing. Remarkable. There's no part of that that isn't 100% amazing. Question six, by what means does the cochlea transmit its sound information to the brain? How does that snail convert information and send it to your brain? Through nerve impulses via the auditory nerve, through mechanical energy via the ossicles, through physical sound energy via the tympanic membrane, or by ele electrostatic means through the cochlear membrane. Okay, the answer is through nerve impulses via the auditory nerve. So once the cochlea transmits those vibrational energies through its stereocilia, that information is sent via the auditory nerve from the cochlea to your brain. And now you experience sound and music and speech and noise. What is the best strategy for avoiding hearing loss? Use earplugs. Avoid loud sounds altogether. Listen at or above 95 dB. Listen above 120 dB with earplugs. Okay. C and D are both terrible advice. A is pretty good advice. Yes, as a music technologist, you should always have access to earplugs. Mine are always on me. But the best way really is just to avoid loud sounds as much as possible. The problem is those hairs inside your cochlea just break off and then they're just garbage. It's like losing your finger. Someone cut your finger off, right? It's gone now and will never come back. This is what's happening to your hearing. And anytime you're doing this, like you got that going on, just look at this picture until the truth detonates in your mind. Yeah, you're just breaking your hair cells off until they're garbage. And then you spend the rest of your life saying what? Okay, the best way to avoid that, of course, is if you have access to the volume, just, hey, just turn it down. Uh, but in music technology, often you can't leave the area. So you, you got to put your earplugs in, right? But of course, the best way to avoid hearing loss is to run away like you're on fire. Just, I'm leaving, guys, right? And then everyone makes fun of you. But then when they're old, all they do is say what? But you can still understand speech and language, and therefore your human relationships are much better because you took proactive measures. Wear earplugs, get the heck out of there, or turn the volume down, right? It's just, here it is, man. It's destroying your body. And the meat inside your skull is being manhandled into submission by high sound pressure level. This is happening whether you're willing to admit it or not. You cannot function as a music technologist or a producer or an engineer if you have Terrible hearing. Public service announcement over. The phenomenon sometimes occurs after exposure to loud sounds. So if you do find yourself in a loud listening environment, you might experience not cochlea frenzy or tympanic hemorrhage or auditory shred, but a phenomenon called temporary threshold shift. And this is a desensitization of your hearing coupled with the feeling of cotton being shoved in your ears, and there might even be buzzing or hissing, some sort of uh, tinnitus accompanying it. Yeah, this is called temporary threshold shift, which is your body saying, all right, I guess you're just going to do this now. So it's a defense mechanism where your, your body attempts to stem the flow of loud sound pressure level into the cochlea. You know, it's more or less successful, but usually means that you've busted off some hair cells, you've caused some inflammation, right? You've done damage. Okay, so how, how loud is too loud? So uh, the American Tinnitus Association, for people who suffer tinnitus like I do, I have raging tinnitus in, tinnitus in both of my ears and will have it on the day that I die. It just never goes away. In any case, tinnitus is, which is hissing or buzzing in your ears is caused by hearing damage. And this association recommends that anything over 85 dB is just doing damage, right? When you're on the vacuum cleaner, you got to wear earplugs. 
a violin. I, I've been teaching violin this semester, and I wear earplugs when I practice because this little animal is a beast. It just shouts sound. It's amazing how loud it gets. Uh, and then there's the obvious, right? Helicopters, grenades, tanks. Yeah, you're just destroying your ears. Check this out. Headphones, 100 to 110. All right, just headphones. And then just uh, look at this picture again. All right, or how about this one? Yeah, your hearing is just shitty now. That's what's happening. Question nine, what condition describes ringing in the ears? Well, I hope you were listening. That, of course, is tinnitus. I've heard it pronounced tinnitus, but tinnitus is how I've heard a medical professional pronounce it. And then sounds at this DB level cross over into to the realm of feeling. Okay, so sound starts to get crazy damaging. You know, once you get up over 100, 110, 120, you actually start to feel the sound. Like you feel the meat inside your skull operating in quite the unpleasant fashion. And then at 140, it physically hurts. So if you hear a sound and your ear hurts, like, okay, not only have you done damage, but that's 140 dB. And then you're decentering into sounds, just like a rocket engine, cannon muzzle, jet engine. And that's just turning your tympanic membrane and your cochlea into chipped ham. It's just destroying the meat inside your skull viciously. and then you spend the rest of your life saying what so it is imperative as a music technologist to preserve your hearing have a nice day take care